All right, all right, all right. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Amuna. I pray everybody's doing well. All right, all right. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Amuna, like I said, and I pray everybody is doing well. For those who have just joined us, welcome. We are on the latter part of this here series. The never-ending series, it feels like. But we 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 wrapping it up. And today I thought it was gonna be the end, right? I was like, yeah, this is it. I'm gonna do the aftermath today. But then as I was uh uh, perusing, you know, prepping my notes. I was like, oh no, I can't make this be the end because there's something else that needs to come before the aftermath, right? And so I, 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 I'm not going to go through the fullness of his sickness. I, I adjure you, please read it. Uh, actually, Sadella goes into it more than anyone else does. And um, yeah, it's a heavy time period. However, what I am going to do is go over what leads up to it right what leads up to it so blessings and give thanks to everyone who has just joined us all right now i'm gonna save don taylor for last today because he goes into more detail right so we're gonna cross reference as we have been doing and shout out to those who just joined us as fever says smash the like button you don't know if you're enjoying the book club, if it is popping, if it is doing what it's supposed to be doing, then smash the like and share and ting. You understand? It's all love. So I am going to start first with, who am I going to start first? Today is not going to go in sequential order of who wrote the books. We're going to start with Rita today. We're just starting. We're just starting Prudent Man. Welcome to the conversation. We are starting now with Rita. And I'm going to get started early today because we have a little bit to go through. You understand? So Rita, on the topic of Dan Taylor, chapter 12, uh, chapter 12, page 162, right? She says, then there came a time when the whole vibe started to change. This began to happen after Don Taylor had been fired from his job as Bob Marley's manager. So this is why it says, Don Taylor, you're fired. Rita's giving us the aftermath. Then I'm going to go backwards because sometimes you hear the story, but you don't know how it got to that point. So let's listen to what Rita is saying about, you know, how the thing went downhill after Don Taylor got fired. Danny Sims along with Alan Cole, AKA Alan Skill Cole, right? Was now managing the tour. Danny Sims, who took our demos over the years and sold them and claimed most of Bob's publishing rights from the early days. So she's already telling you, she's framing it for us that the thing I get bad because these people who are in, in charge of the tour shouldn't necessarily be the people who's in charge of the tour, right? It says, and I'm there thinking, wow, What's going on? After Bob had signed with Island, I didn't participate in his financial or managerial decisions. So then we have to ask the question, when did Bob sign with Island? Because based on what Rita is saying, it's been a good couple of years that she no, basically she no know what going. She was paid as a, um, she was separate from her business with Bob. She's paid as an employee of the I trees. She already told us that. And so she, as the wife of Bob, Rita, I'm gonna know why you stop using my name. She don't know what's going on. Okay. Then everything began to unravel. So I know I hear a lot about Don Taylor. Again, I don't have a dog in this fight, but for someone who's reading the books. And, and juxtaposing them one story to the other, 
why would things not go downhill while Don Taylor is in position? Why is Rita marking Don Taylor being fired as the reason that things are going downhill? That's just a question I would have, right? It says here, then everything began to unravel. At the end of September 1980, we arrived in New York to do a show with the Commodores at Madison Square Garden. The other members of the group were separated from Bob. We were put in Gramercy Park Hotel downtown. Now, if you read Don Taylor's book, he sounds like a manager. Like he remembers times, dates, occurrences, people. He's very meticulous, I noticed, very meticulous in this area, right? So what Nirita is noting is the change in how they were, the bookings, the change. Because according to Don Taylor, he would always put Rita to floors down from Bob, right? But Rita is noting that as uh, somebody who's working on the tour, stuff is not what it used to be. Yes, Bob did say that. Rita, why didn't I stop you? It was my name. That's according, allegedly, according to Don Taylor, he said that, right? So Rita is noting here that, that they were not only put on separate floors, they were put in separate hotels. It says the other members of the group were separated from Bob. We were put in the Gramercy Park Hotel downtown, and he was at Essex House on Central Park South. She's noting it because that's weird, okay? Remember, the manager, the tour, the tour manager is responsible for all of these things, right? It says, I heard later that some hustler dreads from Brooklyn who had attached themselves to the tour had offered him something, though I don't know whether or not he took it. I don't know who they offered that. Who's the he? But well, I'll continue. After he after the show, he stayed up all night. Bob told me later I called him the next morning, which was a Sunday, to ask if he wanted to go to church. Because ordinarily, whenever we were in a city that had an Ethiopian Orthodox church, we had been making sure to attend. Greetings and welcome to everyone who've just joined us. No worry, we just start. So again. We just start, Rita's noting, from Dan Taylor come out of position, the thing said kind of shaky, okay? So she has said, if Bob won't go to church. Pascaline from Gabon answered. So they put them in totally different hotels, which was, according to her, not the norm. And now Pascaline is answering the phone? What's really good? You know what I mean? She he said, when she got on the phone, I thought, wow, what's she doing there so early? My dear, she go that time, that all night, we don't know. Then Bob picked up and said he didn't want to go to church, which was unusual, and he didn't sound like himself. So I said, what happened? You didn't sleep last night? Hmm? Bob said, no, I got church. Mm -mm. He said, no, not really. Then he went on to say that he was fine, but that he couldn't make it to church, and he was going to send the limousine for me. Still, something in his voice sounded strange and distant. Right? So, Pascaline Dede, nobody else know Dede at Essex Halls, but Pascaline Dede at Essex Halls, Wagwan, and Skill Cole, and Danny Sims is in charge of the tour. It, she goes on to say, he said, not really. Okay, Okay, then him sounds strange. Minnie was with me, and I kept having the feeling that something wasn't quite right. So I said to her, Yo, Una no give me a joke early, you know. <laughs> I'm not even gonna read the chat, yo. Y'all got jokes early. <laughs> but no, I laugh. But no, I read the chat. Yo, love was waking. That's funny. Um, when we shot me there. It says goes on to say, um, you go up there and see what's happening because I keep having this nagging feeling. We soon learn who Pascaline is. That's why I couldn't skip this one. I had to kind of, I had to kind of take my time. So no worry, we're going to come to that. All along, something just didn't seem right. So she's saying that some dreads from Brooklyn who had attached themselves to the tour offered Bob something. This is what she heard to the grapevine, right? And she's saying that Bob was separated from everybody and not moving. It was moving kind of shaky. You understand? So no, she wants somebody to go check on him. Although, all along, something just didn't seem right. When Minnie got up town and went into Bob's room, she looked at him and she told me 
this years later that she saw death. To her, he looked like a ghost. Eventually, they told us what happened, that Bob collapsed while he was running in Central Park. Because in another part, we hear that he often liked to stay where there was a place for him to exercise, play ball or do whatever. So he was close to the park and we found out through another account that he fell down. He and Alan Cole had gone jogging to, quote, energize Bob, who in mid-run had suddenly felt his body freezing up on him. When he turned to tell Alan that something was wrong, he couldn't move his head or speak and fell down. Now they were waiting to see Danny Sims' doctor, but Bob wanted us to go ahead to the next concert location, which was Pittsburgh, and he would see us there. Okay, so this is 1980. Already he'd been diagnosed with the cancer. Already he got his toenail removed. Already he's still been, you know, the stress of touring, touring, touring all over the world. And he falls down in Central Park. Nobody had said anything to me about Bob falling, which I thought was disrespectful and suspicious. I agree, Rita. That, that, oh, that, oh, that mech. Anywho, but when I guess the lifestyle had so broadened and so many people were riding on our earnings that he wasn't in control anymore over who knew what or when. And I remember, again, this, this is about Don Taylor being fired. And although she doesn't say it, she's saying it that, you know, ting on ting on guan. She goes on to say, other people had taken over his life completely and I didn't know. Who's the other people? Now that me want to call them name now. Maybe he didn't even know what he was eating or smoking because usually he would carry his chef or hire somebody to go along to prepare food, right? And also the smoking thing. Yes, people can, as we know, lace up your things and you don't know, right? She says, I still don't know though. Over the years, I've heard a lot of stories about what had been happening are going on without my knowledge again, because Rita is getting pushed further and further out from this here conversation. So I did go on to Pittsburgh, even though I knew something wasn't right. During the night, I dreamt that Bob was inside a fence in place and that couldn't have been a hospital, but it had bars and he didn't have any hair on his head. Okay. He came to the fence to say something, but we were separated by this grill thing. And I woke up thinking again that he didn't look right to me. Something had still not been explained. The next morning, I called Marcia and Judy, who told them and told them about the dream. And then I decided to call New York and see what was happening. When I reached Bob's number there, the phone was answered by a Jamaican journalist named Fritz, who was doing public relations for the tour. When I said, Fitz, what's happening there? He said, man, it doesn't look right. I started to panic. What do you mean it doesn't look right? What the blink? What F-bomb? Mama Rita drop F-bomb from them. What the blink is happening to Bob? What happened to my husband? Fitz said again, man, something is not right and they need to talk to you. Which is disrespectful for true, bro. All of this is happening he got, you know what I mean? And y'all are not informing like, oh, Disky, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. At the point I started to curse. Listen to me. I said, if you all stay up there and let anything happen to Bob, you will have to answer questions because something is blinking wrong and nobody telling the truth. F bomb again. I hung up the phone and oh, I was upset. I began to feel panicky. A couple of hours later, Bob arrived and they said it was time for sound check. So I got on the bus where he was waiting, looking terribly pale. Bob, what happened? I, oh, wait, quietly. Sorry, she said quietly. Bob, what happened? I said quietly. Come on, man, tell me the truth. You don't look right. What happened? You didn't sleep? What happened? What happened yesterday? He took me aside in the bus and said, well, Danny Sims took me to the doctor. And the doctor says that he has cancer. She says she felt as if her heart had left her body. What are you talking about? She said, something is wrong here. Somebody's trying to hurt you. Let's go home. Immediately, I wanted to go. It was, 
Oh, give me a second. Give me a second. See? Fire alarm. It's a false alarm. Hold on, everybody. That fire alarm be tripping. Sorry about that. As a matter of fact, let me double check. <laughs> One second. Let me double check. Let me play a commercial. I'll be right back. Listener, all of this jokes and reading got me feeling a little hungry. Do you guys come with your snacks ready or do you think it's time for an ital food break? The Ross and him Empress say, yeah, ital food break. So listener, this is Imuna and not only do I read and write novels, I also do a little something, something. Well, a kind of big something in the kitchen, right? So I wrote this amazing hay pumpkin cookbook. Inside, pumpkin seed milk, carrot punch, smoothie, listener, even jerk tofu strips. But the tofu is made from pumpkin seeds. So join me on a culinary adventure with the pumpkin seed as we explore the benefits of this green superfood. You already know, potassium, zinc, it is loaded and highly beneficial. Again, a high source of iron, zinc, magnesium, vitamin E, and it helps boost the immune system. This book, as well as Island Twist, is available on Amazon today. So go on over and let's get back to the story. All right, all right. Everything is everything. Everything is everything. Let's get into this. So, so Rita says she won't go home, right? This is live, y'all. <laughs> this is live. <laughs> Rita says she want to go on, right? She said, you don't look right. Um, so she he says that Danny Sims took him to the doctor and they said it was cancer. Where am I? Immediately, I wanted to go. It was as if I'd gotten so scared that I wanted to stay away from everybody because I didn't know who around was the enemy or who was the friend. Ring the alarm. <laughs> Oh no, I'm not... <laughs> I jumped off the bus and went to find Marcia and told them the story. We were all furious. Can you imagine? This is what Bob is telling me about and nobody called us. Of course, everybody was kind of suspicious, but Bob said they were going to do the concert that night anyway. And as we know, history, this is actually the last concert he ends up doing, right? Uh, but I said, no, you don't. I hunted up Danny Sims and said to him, how dare you? What is this, a game? How could you do this? And then I found Alan Cole. So it's interesting, the conversation we're hearing in 2024 with some people who are still here. But according to Rita, she's going in, right? So she hunts up Alan Cole. And I said, what exactly is happening? Tell me. And then finally, they said the doctor told them that the malignancy in Bob's toe had spread to his brain and that he was going to die anyway. So they might as well continue the tour till he dies. This is what she's asserting that Alan said. Huh? Huh? That might as well. What kind of something that? I mean, uh, this is allegedly. But what kind of might as well him I got dead anyway? So, so who, you know, what? let's continue. I was outraged as anyone would be. I said no. And then it seemed as if I needed additional backup. So I rang to the phone and called Bob's mother and told her to please help me out, to please call and intervene. I called Diane Jobson, Chris Blackwell, Bob's business lawyer, David Steinberg, and told them the same thing. I even called Dr. Bacon in Miami who said he'd been expecting this and could have prevented it, that things needn't have been this way. I was devastated. So she's calling everybody because on one side they're saying he's sick, so they're going to keep pressing him to get every last drop out of him. On the other side, she's like, hey, stop the presses. And she's trying to get everybody to say, yo, stop. What are y'all doing? Anywho, goes on to say, 
I was devastated. Then I ran back to Danny and Alan and screamed, we can't go on with this. It's crazy. You got to stop this show. Now stop, 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 stop. She abalo, she abalo them to stop. She abalo them to stop. And they know I stop it show. Ask Aunt Rita. So now when I see even the interview, the way in which Alan, his energy towards Rita, I'm like, where is this energy coming from? But clearly they had a conflict of interest, according to the narrative, right? According to the narrative. Now, since she said she called Sadella, let's go ahead on to Sadella to tell us about her viewpoint of why uh, Don Taylor got fired. And Sadella's going to lead us up to the same thing. And then we're going to go to Don last because Don gives us the more full body to count, right? So Sadella Sadella, Mekrisino, Madabuka. We are on chapter 16. Chapter 16, page 172. All right, boom. Nesta and his manager, Don Taylor, had always had their differences. But the first serious dispute I witnessed between them happened at this very house that Nesta bought me in Miami. It happened because of some money quarrel. I don't know the fullness of it. All I know is that one day, that's why I'm going to save Dan for last because sometimes people know a story, but they don't know the fullness. So we're going to save Dan for last. It says one day, all I know is that one day, Nesta backed up Dan Taylor in the drawing room and gave him a good thump, toppling him over, panning backside. Really, Sadella? Why you like thumping people up, fam? It says here, uh, I ran to Nesta and cried, no, no, no trouble him, no trouble him. Don scrambled to his feet, bruising himself, or oh, sorry, brushing himself off, bawling, what m, Bob? What m? What this come from? And he rushed after Nesta, babbling explanations. Not babbling explanations. There was a concert shortly afterwards in Gabon, and a serious dispute between Nesta and Don Taylor developed over some fees that Nesta felt he hadn't been paid that were due to him. I heard later that Nesta gave Don Taylor another chastisement over that. So things between them were building, and one day Nesta finally decided that he had it with Don Taylor. Remember, Rita just told us once he fired Don Taylor, stuff went downhill. Nesta and one of his best friends, Skill Cole, we just heard what Rita said about the Skill Cole situation. But Sadella is saying Nesta and one of his best friends, Skill Cole, escorted him into the back room and closed the door. Yvette was also present. And we read about Yvette like two or three episodes ago. So we're not for say who is Yvette, right? Yvette is supposed to be working on the movement of your people, okay? So Yvette back there too. Apparently, Nesta's intention on this visit was to cut off his management contract with Don Taylor. And he had some piece of paper that he wanted him to sign to that effect. I paid no attention to Don Taylor's arrival because I had been busy in the kitchen. When he'd pass, we'd exchange only the briefest greetings. Over the years, there were many things about the man I would learn to dislike. One day, for example, I heard him say to his wife, April, come on, old foul. No, he didn't call it. According to Sadella, he called his wife an old foul. How can you call the woman that? I challenged him. He just laughed. He thought it was funny to call his wife and faithful companion old foul in the presence of other people. Another time, I told Don Taylor I wanted to buy a new car. He asked me what kind of car I had in mind, and I said a Cadillac. I really don't see Miss Booker driving a Cadillac, he scoffed. So, hey, uh, I really don't see Miss Booker driving a Cadillac, he scoffed. Why you say that, I asked. April added, make the lady buy whatever car she want to buy. A couple of days later, as we were on our way to the airport in Don Taylor's car to pick someone up, I asked him, hey, Don Taylor, what kind of car this? A Cadillac. He said cockily. Then why you say me shouldn't have one and is one you driving? Me no mean nothing, Mother Booker. He squealed. Me uncle mean for say them car ya big. 
What's going on, everybody? Welcome to just, uh, those who just joined us. Remember, <laughs> when uh, Yvette was driving the Cadillac and, and she boxed Yvette, and Yvette run up in the banking, the car big for two. You have to care manage the car. On this occasion, after Don Taylor and Nesta had disappeared into the back room, no, no, wait, hold on. She says, no, no care it big, I replied, is what me want. I thought his attitude grudgeful and small mind. Thought she would have said did bad mind, but she said small minded. On this occasion, after Don Taylor and Nesta had disappeared into the back room to do their business, I returned to cooking the meal, leaving them with their affairs. A few minutes later, a blood curdling scream rang from the back of the house. It was Don Taylor bodying, Lord, he might murder him. Help, help, help. So it must, she said Don Taylor ballowed for murder. Okay. I ran to the office, pushed open the door, and barged into the room. Don Taylor was flat on his back, screaming and cowering on the floor, while Nesta stood over him. Evidently, Don Taylor wasn't signing the paper as he was asked to do. Mother Booker, Don Taylor blubbered. Mother Booker, help, help, Mother Booker. All right, Mama Nesta said smoothly. You just go back out there. Go on back. Ron saw. So Nesta felt like he could just, and his mother also, that was that, that normal vibration that you could just dump up people and box up people and do all of them something there to other people. I don't know about that, bro. <laughs> yeah, that, what are we doing here? All right, mama. So, so Nesta tell him, mother, for grand man, go around the front. No trouble, no trouble him, I beg. No lick him no more. Nesta yanked him off the floor, gave him a violent shake, and threw him towards the door. Don Taylor slunk quickly out of the room and scampered into his car. Then he roared out the driveway like a devil, like the devil was on his tail, she says. A few minutes later, Nesta, Skill Cole, and Yvette went out together. I returned to cooking dinner. The doorbell chimed. A white woman was standing at my door, flashing a badge. She introduced herself as surgeon so-and-so of the state police remember when she did box event event car police too you know <laughs> may i speak to robert marley she asked he's not here i told her peering into the house she spotted out one of my workmen in the dim light so who's that she asked pointing robert marley is not here i said sharply no matter who that is it is not robert marley she consulted a clipboard what about yvette anderson She's not here either. And Alan Cole, none of them here. She handed me a card and told me that as soon as any of the three returned, they were to call her, that a formal complaint had been filed against them for assault. Okay. Then she got in her unmarked car and drove away. A few minutes later, Nesta, Skill Cole, and Yvette returned. I told them breathlessly that the police had just been here asking for them. Don't tell us send police here, Nesta asked with scorn. I knew him would have do that. So where you beat up a man for if you know saying would have send police come, come, to, come to you? Where you beat him up for? Uh, Nesta got on the phone with Danny Sims, one of his earlier producers, and told him that Don Taylor had sent police around him yard. So when they tell him to pump up that... that. <laughs> Not that. True. Take care. I it for me, no? I heard Nesta say. Danny said he would, and he did, for nothing more came of the incident. The police never returned, and no charges were ever filed. Personally, I always thought my son was far too lenient with Don Taylor. Nesta was not hard, not a hard man to deal with, as far as I'm concerned. Whatever chastisement he gave to Don Taylor was richly deserved. So I'm going to keep going a little bit because she's going to come to the, the Central Park thing too. But did she just say that she saw nothing wrong with what that Nesta just did to Don Taylor? Let's continue. Judgment Day came for Nesta not long after his chastisement of Don Taylor. And it fell on the whole family as unexpectedly as a clap of thunder on a cloudless day. Okay? So we, chronologically, this happens before 
the, the, the whole diagnosis thing. One day the phone rang. It was Rita calling from New York. Remember, we just read Rita saying that. Greetings and welcome to those who have just joined us. We just heard Rita saying that, right? We just heard Rita said that she called everybody, including his mother. One day the phone rang. It was Rita calling from New York to say that Nesta was sick. But she did not tell me the story to the fullest, only that Nesta was not feeling well. Shortly afterwards, the phone rang again and Yvette answered. She huddled in a corner, whispering in the mouthpiece, looking stricken with worry. When she hung up, I asked her bluntly, what's going on? I don't know, she said, trying to sound offhand. Bob's very sick, but I'm not sure what's happening. They called back and let you know. They'll call back and let you know. I knew right away that everyone was trying to hide something from me. I could smell trouble in the breeze. They'd done this to me before even though I repeatedly urged them to always be open and above board with me so I could bring prayer to bear on any tribulation. But because they knew I had high blood pressure, they always tried to hide any trouble or worries from me. From the way everything was, everyone was whispering around me and murmuring into the phone, I knew something serious was going on. Stories began appearing in the news that Nesta had collapsed in Central Park in New York while jogging they should have told his mother they should have told his mother and shout out to fever for reminding the people in the comments section our family and friends don't forget to smash the like button thank you thank you thank you for that i'll come to the comments in a little bit you guys because we got one more story to read right so she's filling in the gap of what was happening with her. So she starts to see it in the paper. When Nesta came home a few days later, he looked tired and drawn. I asked him what had happened and he said his head had suddenly started to spin and he'd passed out in the park. I asked him the usual mother questions. Had he gotten enough sleep the night before? Could he have been hungry? Did somebody give him some strange food or drink? What did the doctor say? He said he had to return to New York for more tests. Don't worry yourself, mama, he said. He would be all right. But the sneaky whispering, the guarded looks I was getting when I entered the room, the sudden silence that fell among talkers once I came in within earshot, the gloominess that seemed to surround Nesta on his brief visit, all of these signs told me that something bad was in the breeze, something no one wanted her to hear. Listen. I said to anyone who would heal, heed, if me don't know now, me going know later. So better me know now when me can pray and ask traffic guidance and support. Know what? Nothing to know. So what am I tell lie to the man for? Sorry. Who say anything wrong? Ask your son now. Everything under control, mother booker. Me no know where you are talking about. And so it went from those few days that Nestor returned home after collapsing in Central Park. Soon he left again for New York for further medical tests. He said, acting cool and calm about it, he would never again return to her house. So he came after the Pittsburgh, went to Miami, had to go back to New York. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm, a, I'm a ready today, you know, I'm a ready today. <laughs> Nadine said, where my face there? <laughs> I'm ready today, man. <clears throat> Sometime the light. Sometime the light. A, day, a few days after Nesta was gone, I received an urgent call from New York. Come quickly, your son needs you. So that was wrong. They set the lady up. Let me get a little sip of water. Yes, sir. They tell her there's nothing to worry about. Now you're talking about come quick. He goes on to say, he was staying in New York at an apartment owned by a friend. I hurried to his side and got a dose of bitter news. Nesta had a brain tumor. The cancer had traveled from his toe to his brain. It was inoperable and untreatable. The doctor said they could do no more. They had sent him home to die. Sad. <clears throat> Goes on to say, they said Nesta had at most three weeks to live. In New York, uh, Sedella stayed with Nesta for three nights. They prayed together for strength, read the Bible, especially his favorite passages. They shared many quiet moments together. 
but he did not discuss death or what the doctors had said. Nesta said that Danny Sims had advised him to make a will. This comes up later on, right? But Nesta was stubborn and hadn't given up on life. Then, no, when man, he said, then no, oh, hold on there, sorry. Because when a patwa, you have to address your brain to patwa. Then, no, when man ready for dead, that he make will. Nesta, you know what? He asked scornfully, who ready for dead? So, what's repeating for me, what's cyclical for me is when uh, Norval, his father, doesn't have anything for him, right? Even when he was old, even, and Sadella's asking, remember the lady, Miss Marley too? She's like, yo, what do you mean? Is there absolutely nothing? And Nesta kind of came in that same vein, even though he's being advised to make preparations, even you can make a living will, right? It doesn't mean that when you're dead to make preparations, he has the lawyer around him, he has people around him, but he's refusing to do so, right? He'd sent to Jamaica for Dr. Carl Frazier, Pee Wee, a Rasta brother who was a medical doctor at the University of West Indies Hospital. Pee Wee arrived to be with him during the medical consultations. After going over Nestor's charts and consulting with the new doctors, Pee Wee had come up with a last resort idea. Nestor would travel to Germany and be treated at the clinic of Dr. Joseph Isles in Bavaria. Okay. So I'm going to pause there because that brings us up to the same part that Rita left off on, okay? Sadella told us what was happening during the firing, what she heard and experienced is that them try to not try to beat up Dan Taylor and try to force him to write himself out of the managerial contract. But why? What happened? What happened? Why, why all of this fighting? Why are they forcing and they fighting, brother? A long time in a sing, right? Why are they forcing and they fighting? Let's see. Let us see. So we shot me there now. Do, 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 do. This is coming from Don Taylor's book. And this is chapter 13 titled The Breakup. The Breakup. Okay. And he goes over Bob Marley's visit to Shashamani, Bob Marley's visit to Ethiopia, because at the time, Alan Skin Cole is in Ethiopia. Um, this is before it happens. He goes into a lot of stuff about Skin Cole. But for the purposes of this here conversation, Bob goes to Ethiopia, which is kind of like, uh, you know, he made homage. He paid, he, he, he did, he, he was able to finally make it to the quote promised land, the place that he's been talking about and, and singing about and looking towards. He was able to go there before he passed. Right. And I'll give you guys a little tidbit. I made the journey to Ethiopia over 14 years ago to went to Shashamani. I made the trek. I made the track. That's another story for another day, but yeah. Yeah. That part right there, that part right there. So it's it's an interesting thing to go to see and to connect what is being said to what is doing. You know what I mean? What the people are really doing. And I and I lived there for a good almost a year. So you know that's another story for another day. But again, Bob makes that track. I just wanted to throw in that little tidbit there. Let me continue. And let me just say, when you get there. If they think you are anything or you come from any place in the Caribbean, the first thing they're going to say is Bob Marley. <laughs> I'm like, yo, bro, everything is not Bob Marley. Bob Marley, Bob Marley. I'm like, y'all doing the most out here, man. But let's continue, everybody. Let's continue. So I'm on page one. <laughs> you don't know already. You don't know already. Page 173. It's page 173. Um. All right, cool. So the breakup between Bob and me really started on the second tour in LA when I was approached by a guy called Babette who I had not met before, but who in the past had worked for James Brown, okay? This was all I knew then, but I learned that 
Babette was regarded as an informer in the business, having in the past informed on artists regarding payroll scams. In retrospect, I should have been more careful in dealing with him, especially as I heard rumors of his unreliable character. So now everybody's out here saying, um, uh, said Don Taylor is scamming, but Don Taylor is saying this particular guy was kind of scammy, right? But against his better judgment, he goes into dealings with this Babette guy. He says, this time Babette was representing a family from Gabon. In fact, it was the president Omar Bongo and his family. And I somehow felt he might be genuine. So remember after this point, he healed from, remember the last time we saw him, he got, he was in the attempt in 76. He was injured. He had to do surgery. Now he's back in his position as the manager, right? He went back to work. He says he played at UCLA on the Saturday before to, to a sellout crowd of 14,000 and would be playing that night at the Roxy in a benefit concert for Sugar Ray Robinson. The benefit for Sugar Ray was $100 per ticket and you still could not get near the door. It was a resounding success and we were very pleased to hand over the proceeds to Sugar Ray whom we had all, sorry, had all long admired, all right? Greetings to those who have just joined us and thank you for your patience. It says, that same night, Babette turned up with two girls who said they were the daughters of the president of Gabon. I remember one was called Pascaline. So everybody keep asking who's Pascaline. He's leading us up to the Pascaline and, and there are plenty of pictures of, him, of Bob with, um, Pascaline, right? The girls not only wanted to come backstage to meet Bob, they also wanted to invite him to a private dinner. On tour, I was always protective of Bob and made every effort to protect his privacy and limit the hanger honors and hard drug pushers. Remember what Rita just told us. Rita told us when Skip, when when um, Don Taylor stepped out of position, it went downhill. Now, Don Telly is telling you what he used to do on tour, like his own personal bodyguard. Remember, we read before he was like he had access to Bob's room. He always knew what was going on. He was protecting him to a certain degree. So he says, I was always protective of Bob and made every effort to protect his privacy and limit the hanger ons and hard drug pushers. So I was not too anxious to see him go out with these people. Finally, however, at their insistence, I introduced Bob to Pascaline, which ended up with Pascaline inviting Bob to a dinner at their house in Beverly Hills on Foothill Drive. You know, I remember, I wish I had to play it today. One thing we can't say about, um, I don't know any of these people. He's a, he, he gives a lot of information that could easily be cross-referenced. He gives time, date, places, people, occurrences, and he's doing it at a time where a lot of this stuff could be cross-referenced. You know what I mean? Let's continue. I accompanied Bob, and because Bob would not eat just anybody's cooking, on the few occasions when we ate out, we had to have our host hire a special lady to cook his food. Yeah, can rest and not just eat no mix-up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry. In L.A., it was a lady called Del Rose who had a restaurant in L.A. called Del Rose's Jamaican Restaurant. She was the only person whose food Bob would eat other than his own traveling cooks. So he made it quite clear that he would go to dinner only if Delroy, Delrose cooked his food. Mm -hmm. Pascaline's motives were quite obvious as she was already clearly attracted to Bob. So attracted was she that even after Bob's death, she named her first child Nesta. I never know that. That's news to me. A lot of this is news to me. In addition to her obvious interest in Bob, she wanted to hire him to come to, sorry, to come down to Gabon to play at her birthday party. So we're getting, remember, Don Taylor, you're fired. That's what we're reading. For those who just joined us, if you missed it, you don't know, you have to go, go to the top afterwards. No, no, afterwards. But he's telling you what led to the, the beating in the house, right? They kind of illustrated this, but they, they put it in the movie in Paris, right? They put it, is Paris then put it? They put it when he was out of town. 
I don't know if it's more than one thump up him get. I don't know. But let's continue. The bill, she said, would be picked up by her father. Somehow she got Bob and myself to agree. What's the somehow, though? That's kind of obscure. The somehow she got us to agree. I don't know. So we scheduled the visit and the performance, which finally ran into more than $500,000. Listen, half a million dollar at that time for a birthday party, fam? Come on, fam. What is going on? Mm -mm. Her father is the president of Gabon, and she wants a $500,000 birthday gift because we had to charter all the performance equipment from LA and fly it into the bone as there was none in that country. The person who was arranging all of this was Babette, mm -mm, who by now had revealed himself to be a typical New York hustler. But when you have to come for New York hustler like that, Dan, mm, typical New York hustler himself. As it turned out, the money they gave Babette could only do one show. Though Babette was taking the money from Pascaline and the president of Gabon on pretext that there would be two shows. So basically what I'm getting so far is Don is like, yo, it wasn't me. He was doing the shaggy. It wasn't me, right? After we was told that Bob would not do two shows, Babette then discussed the alternatives. And knowing that I also managed Jimmy Cliff, he made a deposit with me for Jimmy Cliff to do the other show. Where the second deposit for Jimmy Cliff came from, I never knew. So th this seems like, according to what the storyline is, miscommunication, right? I made sure that for this agreement, I gave him two separate receipts, one for Jimmy Cliff and one for Bob. Bobette, however, had not told the president of, of this new arrangement and continued to leave the impression that there would be two Marley concerts. So that when we went down to Gabon, Bob discovered that he was in hot water with the president over the money. So my question would be, why didn't you communicate this to him before you left? Right, yo, they thought it was this, it's not, Jimmy Cliff is gonna, because it would be evident if Jimmy Cliff is there, like, yo, that's why I brought Jimmy Cliff, this, that, and the third. This seems like a breakdown in communication. If the, if the account is what we're gonna accept, right? The president summoned Bob and myself to come and explain to him what was happening. I told him that as the receipts clearly stated, there were to be two shows, one for Bob and one for Jimmy Cliff. And this was my agreement. This was apparently accepted by all, although I could see that Bob was not happy about it and, and seemed to feel that I was siphoning off some of his earnings to Jimmy Cliff. Right. So much so that on our return flight from Gabon, I sat separately and kept my distance, not even responding when Rita came to tell me that Baba realized that what he was accusing me of was not really true. So Akanto, ah, Gantila. When me, when me not understand is a breakdown in communication, but me I go continue because for something you, somebody think you're going to do two shows, you're only going to do one, you negotiate for somebody else and you don't communicate that. As my personal management agreement with Bob was due for the renegotiation, this really came at an opportune time. I needed to consider my own future and I was seriously wondering if it lay with Bob. I had taken him this far and his grasp of the business and his ability to handle most of his affairs by his own methods suggested that the time was fast approaching when we would become too big for the independents and people like me to manage Bob. I had in fact intimated this to him. Now, when you look at the beginning of the agreement, if you get the book, he says that he's already, um, he's already managing acts uh don taylor is and bob is like oh yeah really jamaican or somebody like you may need for manage me you know but he's saying they never had they had a gentleman's handshake and they never had official documentation that said that don taylor was his manager now don taylor i think at the time if you read the book he wanted 20 percent, and bob was like nah 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 i'm gonna give you 10 and they had that verbal agreement 
So at this time, it's some time later. And now Don is thinking, does he want to continue in this agreement or does he want to make his exit? So I'll go on. It says here, on our return from Gabon in early 1979, I went on to Miami and Bob to Jamaica. Our mutual separation had begun. My separation from Bob brought the vultures in. Your year, so they know me. Well, I know who what them children can and they no call no foul. Who is the vultures? Because Rita says when when Don Taylor left, it went downhill. Don Taylor saying when he left, the vultures came in. I would have attack. I would have attack. But we still kept in touch intermittently by phone and through his mother. The phone calls were strictly on business matters, which he still left in my hands, which is curious. Like, if you think the man a thief, right? If you think the man a thief, yo, why you leave accounts with him name on it, business matters in him hand? I mean, I understand, but let's continue. In the 1980 World Tour was actually handled by Skill Cole who had come back from Ethiopia and taken over tour management with Danny Sims. They were the ones who set up the last U.S. and European tours and the later tours of the Far East and Africa. Hold on there. Did I read past the part where me do one stop? Oh, no, 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 no. Let me continue. Because then we get too, we get too scuffle. Rita talk about a scuffle. Did Rita talk about the scuffle? No, me, me not remember. But Sedella did. So now um, Don Taylor is going to talk about the scuffle now. He says, I was fully aware of the fact that all this time Bob should have been seeing the doctors for a monthly checkup. Remember, when it happened, they told him to see Dr. Bacon. And the people around him was burning fire. Nothing wrong with you. All you need a little this and that. Drink some bush tea. Nothing wrong with you. I eat something that left that thing alone, Bob. Right. So he was listening to them and he wasn't doing what he was, was supposed to be doing, according to Don. He should have been seeing the doctors for a monthly checkup. Dr. Bacon kept calling me to inquire after Bob's progress. I, in turn, would call Bob's mother to find out if Bob was following Dr. Bacon's course of action, including a request that Bob try to eat eight ounces of liver every day. In fact, it was Bob who declared the following in an interview. No, hold on, let me get in on my, my, my thing now. Them don't want to run this thing like how I run it. Them want to run me on a star strip. A tri so, them want to run me on a star trip. But I realize my structure run down. I must rest. But they are not concerned with my structure. Them run and plan North American tour. I watch Muhammad Ali and Alan Cole and I see how them athletes take care of them structure. But them people who set up the tour don't not work. Them just collect the money and when night time come, you feel fine them in a bed with two girls while you bust your blinking RC at work all the time. Yo, Bob, fam. <laughs> Bob, <Baba> Quar. <laughs> so the question is, later on I saw that he was into Island Records for 10 records and he was trying to hurry up and finish his contractual obligation this was a con to Don Taylor with them. So who is the them who set up the tour? You know what I mean? Who is the them? It appears then, and I learned this from one of my usual calls, that the doctor's instructions were not being followed. And that, in fact, on one occasion, they even taken Bob to a regular British GP who had not received nor indeed requested any history of Bob's illness, but gave him a physical and pronounced him to be in good health. Are y'all serious? <laughs> he said, Why me do Bob Vice like that? I saw Bob's son to me. I saw him by his son. <laughs> it appears, though, well, okay, so they weren't taking care of him on the road. The matter rested there until Bob came back to Miami for a break after the 1980 UK and European world tour. It was normal to take a break like this before going on to his second scheduled tour of the Far East. When he got to Miami, Bob asked me to come to his mother's house where he was staying and met with him and Alan, who I had not seen since our visit to Ethiopia. Again, remember, this is the story we just hear Sedella tell me. So make we hear it from the other side. When I arrived, 
Bob took me over by the pool where we talked briefly and then he invited me to his room where he handed me a piece of paper and asked me to sign away any verbal or written agreement we had made. Alan had accompanied us to Bob's room and even while knowing what might come next, I refused. So he must realize that yeah, the man them are back him up. Things now became physical and after a lot of screaming and shouting, there was a tussle. Although no real blows were exchanged, he says, for YouTube, the burners were drawn by both Alan and Bob, and Alan actually threatened his life. Huh? Huh? During all this, he happened to look at Bob in whose eyes he could see a world of conflicting emotions. And shortly after the tussle, he said to Alan in an almost total about face, now that we have everything under control, I guess Dan can come back and work for us again. Hmm? It, was all, it was almost as if he considered the whole matter a cleansing experience after which he could now resume a normal relationship. Yeah, it looks like that house. That house was in a, a, a in a, a kind of posh area in a Miami. So yeah, I could now not help but feel the neglected medical treatment. If I'm not mistaken, the picture that I put on the community board, if I'm not mistaken, is the house, and you could kind of see the the fenced in part where Rita is sitting and Don Taylor is sitting across from her on the patio. You could kind of see that. So what was shot me there now? Do, 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 do. I could not help but feel that the neglected medical treatment and the failure of those around Bob to grasp his needs was having a serious effect on his mental as well as physical state. Little did we know the cancer was spreading. Don Taylor says, but this whole episode had finally decided my mind. The, this latest experience together with all of our past associations, including the trauma of his own shooting, made him, and that's a lot to consider, right? Where he's like, yo, bro, I got to part ways. That's a lot to consider. I mean, let's, come on, come on, come on. He says here, um, he's still dealing with the trauma from the shooting. He could never resume a normal relationship with him. I know deep down and still firmly believe that Bob would not hurt or, you know, pie pie nobody. And was in fact just being Bob Marley tough gang at that moment. Perhaps he was even trying to impress Skill himself. Skill, according to Don Taylor, goes to Ethiopia for a very specific reason. So in this book, he doesn't necessarily speak the highest of Skill Cole. And so for him to say that not only is he back, but influencing Bob in a negative way. And this is the reason why he, that whole, oh, you can come back and work for us thing. It's like, he's like, nah, bro, I'm good. As a precaution, however, I reported the matter to the Miami police and knowing the kind of people who hung around Bob for their living, he says he went and bought himself something. Wow. He goes on to say he ended up suing Bob for $500,000 under his contract, understanding which later agreed to settle for a figure which he gave him in cash. This was not settled between them before Bob's death, though he had told his lawyer in Miami to settle with um, Don's lawyer, Stephen Fisher. It was Rita who approached him after Bob's death, saying Bob had intended to settle with him and agreed to a figure with, for personal reasons he could not disclose in entirety. But he received a $75,000 payment, which he got from Rita Marley. So... I read those because I'm like, how am I going to do the aftermath if we don't read that part that led up to this separation and ultimate, you know, fast track downhill that Bob Marley experienced, by which time he's losing his strength. Rita is separated from him. The people is kind of boxing everybody who could possibly, you know, say otherwise out. And the whole you know, he's not going to make it, but let him go on tour anyway. If that is true, I mean, we did see that Pittsburgh was the last show. That, that, that right there, I don't know. 
So with that said, that's what I have for today. I'm going to put the link in the box for anybody who would like to share their thoughts. And if you came in late, it's all good. You could go back to the top of the session and hear all about how things went downhill during that 79 80 period and it went downhill quickly and again prevention is better than cure and there were a lot of according to what is being told to us a lot of indication that something was going on but he was already into uh island records for a certain amount of albums right of which he looked like he was trying to produce at an alarming rate you understand yeah, I'm going to come through these comment sections real quick. And uh, yeah. I mean, I think Don Taylor was more trained to be the manager, right? And the people who came on later may not have been, that That wasn't their necessary strong suit. You understand? And so maybe they are considering other things that, Don was considering holistically, according to his story, the man holistically, right? No, Don Taylor passed a, a good time now. Oh, say, so we have Tasha saying Copeland Forbes also relates the tour to the drop dead story. Wow. Health is wealth and health does come first. I agree, Mika. Wow, 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 wow. We have a similar story of Whitney Houston when she was trying to go back on the road and, you know, if whether or not she was up to it to tour. And if I'm not mistaken, the same similar something happened to Michael Jackson in, in, in whether or not he was healthy enough to go back on the road. Because this touring thing, it takes a lot out of the body. It's a lot of wear and tear on the body, a lot of lack of sleep, a lot of, you know, bad nutrition. It, it adversely affects you after a long period of time. So that's sad to hear that the people were her, who were around him at that time didn't care about the person enough to say, yo, this is this is not good. Belinda says she loves my Bob Marley voice. <laughs> I tried to switch it up, you know? Okay, Monique says, uh, Neville Garrick places himself in the scuffle. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's more than one scuffle. It could be. Yeah, I, call it, I told you, if I got the video of, of him cursing, I don't know if I have, still have the video. Him can drop some BC and some RC. He, you know, outside of singing, you know, he, he looks like he likes cursing. Because, And again, if I never heard it for myself, I wouldn't believe it. But on that Esther Anderson's documentary, I was like, man, man, can't go somebody with man. Mm-hmm. I'm just coming through the comment section, everybody. I'm giving my voice a little, a little, a little something. <laughs> Gloria said, "What's up?" You know, she said, "Bob was a girl, them sugar." <laughs> what I'm to know. You know, she said, "Here comes the girls, them sugar." It was the girls, them sugar. Okay, Dr. Charles says that she know Del Rose very well. She always talked about cooking for Bob and now Ziggy. I always thought she was exaggerating. Look at life, small world. Yes, there she goes. She got a big up in, who we just read, Don Taylor book. Now I'm saying Don Taylor, the way he does the book, if he was lying, he called a lot of people's names. That That's a bra that's brazenness to call all these people's names while they're still alive if you're lying like in the way in which a lot of people are saying he's lying. I'm not, I'm not caping for anybody. I'm just saying the way he tells the story, you can confirm. Look, here we are, 2024. Dr. Charles says that she, Del Rose spoke about cooking for Bob Marley. And it was just confirmed in the book.
It's the it's the beating people for me. I think I saw a, it's 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 what happened to the conversation. If you if you thought unless somebody or unless many bodies are in your ear saying this is a person I tried to from you or this is a person I robbed from you, what happens to conversation? Why are we jumping up and doing the normal and beating people all over the place, right? And then say, oh, you can come back and work for me. Like this is the same guy who was injured, right? And the most I blessed wasn't was able to be operated on. Like, wh where's the conversation in this? Even if you were going to fire the person, did you think they would want to come back after that? I don't know. Mm -mm -mm. All right, we just are come to everybody. I don't see anybody coming up to share their thoughts. So concerning the next one that we have coming up, uh, we're going to look at, we're going to look at, um, what's the next one coming up? I don't know if you guys have saw the Alan, not the uh, Don Taylor footage where where by the time that it was the funeral, he he was trying to keep some uh, decorum about the place and he was going at the reporter. So I have that one that we're going to take a look at. And then we're going to take a look at the aftermath, right? Because even amongst those who said they were there for him, we know Bunny doesn't come to the funeral. We know Peter doesn't come to the funeral for their own reasons. But even after all of what Don Taylor experience, he still shows up. I found that curious. I don't know. I'm just learning all of this with you guys. But I just found that that curious. So we're going to take a look at that after this. So with that said, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Make sure whenever I read, miss anything, bless up everybody who has shared the channel. Do-do-do-do. All right, everybody. My God, we are at the top. I mean, really, we just see things along with the way I, I was speaking. So it's the same way Bob cursed Rita and changed his mind about divorce when he remembered what she did. He was feeling guilty about the Don. I mean, more than feel guilty. Like, who is hyping you up to... <laughs> who is hyping you up? Yeah, there's a mention of Mick Jagger in the book. Like, definitely, if you could get the book get the book. It's a, in, if you could get all these books, get all the books. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm just doing the firsthand readings right now. But if you even can just get these and read them, he does go into that. He goes into a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, L. Cunningham says there was a confrontation with Don Taylor at the hotel in Gabon. And that's where never witnessed the beatdown. The second beatdown was at Don Taylor was in Miami. At that's what I'm saying. It, it could be more than one. And that to only the only thing that make it look kind of weird to me is if you knew that that it was a miscommunication, then you should have said something. You know what I mean? That's what kind of make it look weird. Yeah, he does speak of Neville in this uh, in this book in an interesting light. So you could see why those who we got to see later on took a certain stances that they did because certain things that he said either he he basically he don't sound like he 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 it means in words really. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it means in words. Yeah, man, no worry, cause I'm about to wind down said he wanted 10 albums then after that an artist career is finished right i heard that part i had heard that part or read that part he asked him why 10 albums because he was trying to rinse him dry and then and then you know so this whole this whole thing is just is sad and it's unfortunate and a lot of people need to understand their level of sacrifice and what the person endured at the end of the matter the pain that he endured at the end of the matter, like we read, he was he was paranoid. He, he he didn't know who to trust. He went from this country boy who was insane and running barefoot and teeth in the food out the pot.
to all of these people around him and you don't know what they come for and you don't know how to turn them away and you're stuck now in this construct that you created because you had these ambitions that possibly that you could you know help turn the world around but one of the things that the bible tells you is if you would be wise be wise unto yourself right that means apply the things that you would for someone else onto yourself because you can't save anybody yeah that's that mess every tub of sit on panito on bottom and when we come with the savior mentality it ends up falling back on the person who is trying to think that they can take the, the troubles of everybody on their shoulders it can't work time and time again we see it doesn't work that's why i think history is important when we look at marcus garvey at the end because he felt like he did have good ambitions but he also neglected himself he also neglected his health he also neglected certain things and when when his aims weren't accomplished the way he thought it should be then what happened yana samia say we have similar thing with um malcolm x we have similar thing with um, Mark, um, Martin Luther King. We have so many examples of, you know, I want to make change. I want, I want something different to come about, but it's too much pressure for any one person to try to take up on themselves. I see Jeremiah came to up. I'm going to add him to the stage. Jeremiah, welcome to the conversation. I'm how are you doing? I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. One thing that I was thinking about from before, mm -hmm. um, from listening to some of the other broadcasts, Mm -hmm. um just with bob's like propensity to anger issues because it seemed like he could be maybe a little explosive at times or at least there seemed to be some like pent-up aggression because he had that thug sort of mentality sometimes mm -hmm. and also just with his promiscuity in terms of you know wanting to um be with different women um, I just wonder how much like the marijuana use played into that in terms of providing him a sort of therapy that was able to relieve a certain amount of tension, but because he was utilizing it for that purpose, he was never really getting to the issues that he needed to deal with, which resulted in the negative sort of behavior that he would engage in. So what your thoughts asking. on that? I mean, I, I, I hear you. I see where you're going. Like basically masking, he's using it to cope because of this, because of this anger. So because Ganja has a way to kind of calm you down, it's masked really. Right. Is what you're saying. So when he has these episodes, it's like, where is it coming from? But it's been there all along. Is that yeah? What it's and it just seemed. I think I might have mentioned it like last time I called in, but it just seems like he kind of has these like personality shifts. Yeah. or something like that um because i mean even dealing with don taylor it's like instead of you know just going to the man and like mm -hmm. you know discussing the issue it just seems like he waits until it becomes this like explosive sort of problem right and then handles it in a more aggressive sort of way as opposed to just a normal sort of confrontation correct that and then that's what i was saying i'm like but if you we remember correctly, according to according to uh, Sadella about his father, she said it's like he had quicksilver. Like the people would say he had quicksilver. So speaking of Norval, like he could flip like that. That's what Sadella said way back in the old readings that we read, right? So it looks like he has right. a bit of that, like what you're saying. Like one minute the person is normal, and then the next minute the person chip off. Like where is the in between? Right. You like where do you have the right? to say, I'm questioning what this person is doing, but then you're going to beat him like he's your child. Like, how did you get there? <laughs> right, right. And I, to me, that just seems like a character flaw, which probably means that it was something maybe that he picked up, you know, mm. at a young age, maybe from, you know, his father or whatnot. But that's something that all of us should really strive to correct at some mm -hmm. point so that way like we're actually kind of are able to even ourselves out so that we don't fly off the handle you know what i mean true and that's why even here i i say whether it be in the comment section or whatever we could disagree i always put the link because i understand that the conversation we're gonna have is gonna rub somebody the wrong way this way that way right but use your words 
<laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Speak to the person who you feel like I yeah, don't yeah. agree, but respectfully yeah, yeah. I don't agree. You understand what I'm saying? And I think Caribbean culture yeah, maybe Jamaica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I finished what you're saying. I didn't no, I was saying that right. the Caribbean culture coming from Jamaican culture, that is not always that is not always the solution. That's not the communication style, let me say. Right? The minute we don't agree, first the person is all kind of yeah. everything. <laughs> and then the next minute it goes to another level. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And that caused issues. Uh, in in families, people, community, and even movements. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, when you really check out like how people deal with one another in Jamaica, and I don't know if I'll say something like controversial and people get up in arms or whatnot. It'll be all right. But you know, people people in the islands are very expressive. But I would also say that a lot of people have gone through some challenging things. You understand? Because like the family situation in Jamaica, um, I mean, it's almost like so many people are just filling in family um, because the families are so like scattered, you know, where you don't have like the mother and father together in the same home. And like you have children being raised by all different kind of relatives which can create all kinds of like responses, emotions. And to be frank, like not everybody is treating those children in the best sort of way, especially if they feel like they're taking on some burden that they didn't produce or that they don't, you know, shouldn't be responsible for. Although a lot of people go beyond that and take up that responsibility and still do the best they can. But I mean, that's not the same thing as having the nuclear family intact from the original parents. And I mean, I just think that because of that, like in the culture that that results from that, I think a lot of people, either one, don't have a lot of good modeling in terms of how to handle their emotions in terms of like responses or disagreement. And then they just kind of come up in that sort of mindset where it's just hard for them to like hold back, and, you know? And and it just seems like there's like a quick thing. And, and you know, like the Bible says, like, love is not easily angered. It's not easily provoked. And like, it's not necessarily the fault of people when they're young because, you know, their environment is going to affect them. But at some point in their life, they have to come to terms with like how they respond to people, you know? True. And, and just to say, we can see right now in social media, if you're on TikTok or YouTube or whatever, there's a rise of what is kind of like therapeutic role play, where a lot of Caribbean yeah. uh, men and women are reenacting, right? If you went to therapy and they was like, show me what the person looks like. To us, it's comedy, but the, what they're doing is role playing. And when you see what they're they're reenacting you're like my goodness <laughs> you know what i'm saying this is what they're experiencing yeah this, this is and and it's relatable and people laugh because and, and then we realize wait a minute we all yeah. had the same traumatic experience <laughs> but right well you know it's funny mm -hmm. it's funny because like what you said kind of sparked something in my mind there i had an american friend who was watching a woman from like some garrison community in town where she had had like i don't know if her house like burnt down or like the police had come in and done something and i mean she was just like like losing her mind and i mean like her response was like you know she was talking so fast and like shaking her head around because she was just so like out of her wit you understand mm -hmm. and the person showed it to me and was laughing because to her it came across as humorous but to me, like, I couldn't even laugh because I was like, this woman is on the brink of, like, a mental breakdown. You know what I mean? The one and it's everything like... Everything flooded out when all her... When, when the water flooded everything out? Was that that one? And she was hollering that everything yeah, flooded out? Yeah, I think that might have yeah, been it. That. It was maybe, like, yeah. maybe, like, a year or two ago or something. Like, maybe a couple yeah, years ago. Yeah, I remember ago. that one. Yeah. And I mean, like, it, it really bothered me that the person could laugh at it. But I guess, like 
she wasn't understanding what the person was saying because I mean, most American people, you put them down in Jamaica and it's like, they can't understand anything because right. they're one, they're like intimidated and two, like they're just not used to like different slang terminology and the rhythm of the language and stuff like that. But um, I mean, like when you're in the, like Jamaica's like a pressure cooker, man. <laughs> like, we need just you know? yeah that's what she was saying she said she was saying we need justice and again th that's something interesting to note that someone could be in so much distress but it not be recognized as such you know what i mean but if if it was another yeah. demographic or another people group who was in that much distress it would be outpouring how can we help you and it's just really just being after so many years and decades and generations of this condition you know, it kind of hard in the people, but I have Jay. I don't, you gotta tell me how to say your name, Jasavan. Welcome to the conversation, Jeremiah. You're welcome to stay on. I'm just gonna add him to the conversation. Welcome to the conversation. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, it's Jasavan. Sorry, Jasavan. No problem. Um, I didn't want to um interrupt Jeremiah, but I was trying to get in for so long and I just finally figured it out. But he can, oh. you know, continue and then I'll talk after him. All right, no problem. All right, Jeremiah, you had you had anything else to add? Um no, it does I mean on the one hand, like I think we really should be understanding of what Bob came from. Mm -hmm. Because most of us don't really understand what it's like to come up from the odds being stacked against us to that degree. But at the same time, like it's not an excuse for the person not to take responsibility for themselves and to, you know, um, work through that behavior, you know? And I mean, just for me, from a personal stance, I don't think that's something that we necessarily have the willpower to do on our own. I think it takes divine intervention to be able to overcome um, some of you know those flaws because I think it's a work of the the spirit that has to happen within us it to change those it's, things. It's but, a work. Of, it has but, to be willingness and a desire, like you said. It's a work of the spirit, but you have to want to change. You can definitely change. We can all change, but we have to want to do it. We have to see something wrong with it. When usually sure. it's like. No, that somebody do me that. I saw me grow conceit. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, and usually yeah. with, with the pain, you people who don't heal want to find someone else to give it to. You understand what I'm saying? And therein right. lies the problem. Well, yeah, yeah, but right. But that's why I would say it takes a, a, a supernatural work of grace to actually be free from the bondage of that because the pressure is going to build up and go out a different direction. Like, let's say, you know, you overcome an obstacle in one sort of way where, you know, you have a, a person, you have a person who has an issue with outbursts of anger. Maybe that person like overcomes the outburst of anger, but because the root cause of the issue has never been addressed, like maybe it comes out in a different sort of way where they go out and start gambling or something like that. You know, right. I'm just using some kind of random example because no, no, really. it's off I the top of my head. Right. No, but I think I that's that's go ahead, go ahead. right. Ultimately, like heart transformation, I don't think is something that we can necessarily like um, stir up in ourselves, even though we may be able, we may desire it. That's kind of my point. But that's my okay. personal conviction. So, okay, yeah. But D David said, "Creating me a new heart." Yeah. Right. So, yeah, exactly. When, when we come to the realization that. Again, what we have done and where we are and how we're operating, we no longer want to do that. It's going to be a long process. You understand what I'm saying? But right, but I would done. I would say it's God initiated. God has to initiate that. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think it's it, it's it's twofold because the person has to want. That's why he says creating me a new. The person has to want because everything that we want is already available, but we have to enter in. You understand what I'm saying? We have to be right. prepared and open to go through the process. Exactly. So no, I, I agree. I agree entirely. I'm just, I'm just not under the conviction that we have that desire innately in us. It's something that has that desire actually has to be created in us as well. Ah. Well, we can, we can build partner. Which you're free to disagree with. 
No, I'm thinking <laughs> to a certain degree, just going through a certain process of healing uh, in my own journey, to me, the starter is you have to see that something is wrong with the behavior. And that comes from the yeah, individual. 100%. Say it's the person. The person has to see, yeah, I saw me grow, but something wrong. This this not right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And, and from yeah, there, no, 100%. 100%. Yeah. But that's where right. I'm just saying to, to come to that understanding, I think an external factor has to op take the veil off of your eyes so you can actually see it. You know what I mean? But that's we're just getting into, you know, some theological discussion with that. So I don't want to take it too off. Too off but, course. Uh, you're just getting into But yeah, man, I enjoy the conversation every time. So I'll let every the next time. person come on. I don't want to use up all the time. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, man. Uh, all right, then. Yeah, we'll be on that another time. I saw Hawk came to the thing. It says the device is disconnected. You can come back in. Just yeah. a one, that's how you say it. Please forgive yes. me. Well, all right, you can say it how you want. It's basically all right. A Look more, Mona. All right, then, Jeremiah. It's basically a made up name of me and my kids, and um, I used it for you know, for us to all get on the internet together. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but I want to say good night to everyone. I've good been night. watching you almost from the beginning, probably episode three or four. All right, and I really, really like it. Um, in watching this whole process, you know, I also got kind of more involved. I always liked Bob Marley. I'm Jamaican. Okay. And the movie kind of piqued my interest, similar to you, where you were like, oh, let me go back and read the books. Right, right. And I started, you know, watching you and watching the book reviews and so forth. And I was with the people saying, oh, my goodness, what kind of terrible movies is they made? It doesn't include half of his life and blah, blah, blah. But now that we've, like, in the book club, I've kind of, kind of gone through everything and mm -hmm. you did all that great cross-referencing and research, mm -hmm. I'm like, I think it's a good idea they made the movie the way they made it. <laughs> <laughs> Why you say that? <laughs> because I think if people knew the real deal and all of the warts and all of this mm -hmm. stuff about him, I think he would go down in popularity. I think they would probably me to him. And I think what he did was good. And it was good for, I think, the purposes that he meant it. He wasn't presenting himself as any kind of perfect person. Right. But I think in today's society, you know, once people find out your blemishes, they kind of like, you know, turn against you. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised that he his album, Exodus, got, I, I think Time made it like album of the century. And I'm just like, wow, did they know all this stuff about him? Like, you know, the, the, the womanizing and beating Rita and, you know, all of that stuff. And I'm just like, I, I just wonder if they knew when they gave him that um award or, i don't know all of this stuff like. is out here it this ain't i know it's yeah out they're, they're no. <laughs> it's, it's out all here, out here that's the way we all i think or most of us in the club like didn't really know it right i i'm wondering i don't know but i'm just wondering if those people knew it because i just i just feel like they would have probably not given it to him and like I said, I think he probably would have been me too. And, you know, I just think a lot of the accolades that he's gotten over the years, I don't know, it, 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 I think it wouldn't have been that great. So what I wanted to say is, I don't think they should do it. Like I, at first I was saying, yeah, they should do a Netflix like mini series or, you know, something like that where we, you know, we see everything. And I'm like, no, I think the family did right. They, they showed what they wanted to wanted show, to show. stuff for the most part, you know? Yeah. I didn't, and, like uh, you said, I didn't know all of this stuff was here, but it's not hidden. It's for those who right. desire to know it's there. You understand? So you can't even come back and say, you don't, you didn't know. I think the people of the time knew because it was something it's like to say, if we were around during this time, during certain superstars, you would know. But as time go on, you don't know. Like if you, if if Michael Jackson at the height of everything that was going on, if you were of age and you knew what was going on, it's not a surprise. But people today, younger people would be like, I didn't know that was happening. 
it was all in the news. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I I was like I think I was maybe 12 or so when he died. So although I was aware of him and right. you know like I listen to his music because I think as a kid you don't really like Bob Marley's music that much. It's when you get older and you know you listen to the words and then you really become you know get to appreciate it. So, you know, my mother was into him. She played his music. I knew it, but eh, I wasn't really that into it. So I think, like, maybe that's what it is. Like you're saying, you know, we... And the, the weird thing is I really thought I knew him, <laughs> you know? Right. It's and, the musician, you know, like, saying, this, like everybody's saying. There's the wow. musician and then there's the man. And again, yes. like many people are saying, if you look back at a lot of the artists, <laughs> you're going to find the same stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You have these prolific artist and then you have these very troubled souls and it usually one births the other if you look at some major artists you're going to find similar things all throughout their life they're, yeah. they're struggling in some way and this music is a conduit it's a way for them to express and the reason why it transmits in the way it does is because the frequency of the energy it's felt, mm -hmm. so, it's felt so deeply that it's able to connect they're not singing from the head they're singing from the heart you know what I mean? Which makes a difference. And I think that's why they're able to uh, touch so many people in that way, because it's the vein in which the music was created. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so if you don't mind, I mm -hmm. wanted to touch on his, when he got sick. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, I think as we, we talk about it in the club, I think we're kind of using like today's knowledge and, True. you know, today's atmosphere not just because you know we we now know that he had cancer but i think back then like people weren't quick quick to cut off pieces of their body you know when they when they found that out right. you know I, and i'm wondering if maybe his cuz you know his cancer was very um like in the news and a lot of people after it happened said wow why didn't he cut off his toe and as you know after that as soon as a woman got diagnosed with breast cancer the first thing they're like let's, you know, mastectomy, let's cut it off. Yeah, they were doing that then, yeah. Yeah, we don't want it to spread. But I think the consciousness of the general public, I don't know that that's kind of where our minds would go. And especially like like his mother said, it was just merely a toll, you know? <laughs> you know? At, at the you time, know? yeah. At yeah, you're time. not paying it, paying it that much attention. And I think to his detriment also, his Rastafarian belief kind of, played onto that as well negatively because that was another thing according to the rest of men belief you don't cut your body right. you know so he didn't that was another reason he didn't want to cut it so i mean i and i think you know if if he had known hey this thing can be really serious you know you you, you don't play with it and cutting it i think he probably would have done it regardless of his of his beliefs but at the time yeah it's like like i said our, the general public's consciousness just wasn't into cancer as uh, as knowledgeable about cancer right and the medical well. industry as well didn't have certain you know certain understanding and tools and discovery that yes they did. so yes. there's a whole lot of things we we you're right in that it needs to be put in the context of the time period and what was available to the people at that time there's a lot of people saying that you know his album of the century is for the music like you can't deny that the quality of music that was made at that time still communicates the message to this time. You know what I mean? There's some stuff yes. when you're like, nah, but that is, it's timeless really. So it, them giving him, you know, artist of the century or that album of the century, it, it's really a timeless piece of art, right? That needs to be acknowledged for what it is. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with it. I just wonder if they knew, you know, like I said, Although the info was out there, a lot of us didn't know. And I just wonder if they knew when they did it. And it's, you know, it's really, like like you said, it's timeless. You know, I saw this girl on television and she was like one of those, like, um, I guess they call them preppers. Those like basically like whites that live up in the mountains and they don't want to be part of the regular society. You know, right. like one of those type of people. And she somehow something happened and basically the children were taken away from the parents because they weren't being schooled right they were being exposed to a lot of dangers blah 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 and you know she said when she started going to regular school 
one day one of her friends invited her, I guess, to their room or whatever, and she they played Bob Marley's music. And she's like, remember, I'm living up in the mountains. I didn't have regular bathrooms. Mm -hmm. I didn't know people. I didn't know the, the current movies on TV. So I was very self-conscious, you know? And she's like, and I heard this person singing, and she didn't even know his name. And she's like, I heard this person singing, and he said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery because, you know, none but ourselves can can free our minds. And she was like, and that really was powerful to me because, you know, all these like things that I'm like holding myself back from because I, was, I wasn't raised in the society and so I was afraid to do things. And she was like, yeah, it was my own mental slavery that was keeping me back from doing things. And I was right. like, wow, that made me like him more. I was like, wow. It, yeah, it's, un like, it's a yeah. universal language, really. Yeah. It's yeah. speaking to people um, in a certain position who can identify, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that was what he was able to transmit was this universal message and really connect to people where, where they are. Um, and so, yeah, for that, you have to get thanks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And just know that the person was also very much human. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. And it's just great to, you know, I, I really love this program. And I hope whatever we do next that, you know, I, I really love it and I stay with it because I, I, I really enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have Hawk. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Hawk now to the conversation. Jasavan, thank you for coming through. Greetings. How's, how, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I just want to touch on a few things. I know there's many things I want to touch on, but I'm going to start off with where we left off was about the cancer. Okay. Um, and I know in a previous session, we talked about um, Bob's father being old and how DNA can be old and things like that. And I'm coming, I'm speaking as a doctor. I'm a doctor and I'm a researcher. Okay. Oh, great. So my research is on epigenetics and things like that. But I was going to say, and you said something was really funny. And I say this all the time, just because a man can have a baby at an older age doesn't mean that he should. Right. DNA gets old, <laughs> right? True, true. And, then, and then you, you know, and my grandmother used to say, just because the plumbing works don't mean that you got to use it, <laughs> right? Oh, so, <laughs> grandma got lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But the thing is, you know, if you think most, and in, in, in there's published research on this, when people are, when men are older, like I'm saying 50s and 60s, you can increase your child, your child's chance of getting cancer and mm -hmm. mental illness and mm -hmm. schizophrenia, mm -hmm. because on your DNA is old, but you get these epigenetic marks on there that increases mm -hmm. your chance of having cancer. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like when he was younger and have that weird foot thing mm -hmm. where his foot wouldn't heal. He already showed signs of having a, some type of immune mm -hmm. uh, disorder that was going on. So I just wanted to confirm what you already had touched on. I mean, you were right on point. Thank you. Somebody I'm, said to me, so I don't mean to cut you, but somebody said it kind of jeeringly in the comment section. I'm like, hmm. Okay, so let the doctor guy tell you guys. The moon is gonna sit back here and let the doctor <laughs> tell you. Go ahead, doctor. <laughs> and then I want to talk about. I think Jeremiah kind of touched on this, and it was kind of curious about. Um, and I kind of tell in about Bob's behavior around Dan, uh, Don Taylor and the violence and things like that. Mm -hmm. Not only like genetically, you have a physical manifestation of something like cancer. Remember, Bob and uh, and um, Rita's parents were, I don't know what I would equivalent to, sh you know, sh sharecroppers, like my grandparents were sharecroppers. And sometimes back in them days, they used to just fight it out. And then if you li listen, read Rita's book, she was saying back when reggae first started, they would go to the dance hall. Bob wouldn't want to take her because there was always a fight. But I, I just also want to say, not saying that fighting is the um, ends to a mean. Back in the music industry, from Motown on out, they would take people out to break a contract. That's just what happened. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, and I'm also thinking Bob was like barely 30. We don't know what the evolved Bob would be now. Like Rita, people said, okay, I can't believe Rita put up with this. Yeah, maybe 20-year-old Rita put up with that. 
Right. But the person that she is now and what she does to the communities in Ghana, she's a real queen. So, I mean, me at 30 is different than me now. That's so true. we all we all evolve and 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 become better people. That's the, this whole purpose. But I also want to share like I used to have this mentor, and I'm not gonna mention his name. He was well known. He was a civil rights leader. He was Pan Africanist. And Bob and Rita's story kind of reminds me of him. Now I was younger. He was like a mentor and beautiful wife, beautiful family, but the guy just got around. He just had like women, I'm not gonna mention his name. And I thought about like, why would that be? So we know that sex is a lower energy, right? Is having sex or being sexually attractive, that's your lower root energy. And your mind is a higher consciousness. And I think Bob Marley was channeling so much, so much was coming through him. That was the only way that, I'm not justifying his actions, not at all. But you find that men have a tendency of doing that when they can't when they can't deal with something else. That's all I'm saying. And if you think of all the girlfriends that he had, there nobody was even long term. They were like from one year to another. True. So I, I'm just saying I'm not justifying his action, but I'm just trying to you know bring some understanding like who we are as we evolve as humans. So and we have, Bob, to, we have yeah. to examine promiscuity. Then <laughs> we, have, right. we we have to take a look at it just in general, because a lot of that is actually what's plaguing the culture today. It is played in the culture today. And you have to think about what are we trying to heal that we go the easy route, which is the lower root chakra. And it's not easy taking the high road and being a higher person. There's a lot of things you got to get rid of. There's a lot of times you lonely and working by yourself just because people don't understand where you're coming from. So I'm just saying it could be possible and I could be totally wrong that he was just, it was a way for him, whether he was aware of it or not, of, of some type of grounding, because there was a lot coming through him. I don't care who you, what you believe in, there was information coming through him. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you so much. We have Friday who has joined us. I'm going to go ahead and add you to the conversation. Welcome to the conversation. Let me see here. Thank you, thank you. Greetings. Greetings, and welcome. Is my audio clear? Clear, clear, clear. Awesome. Well, first of all, I just wanna give thanks for this platform that you are holding for everyone. Thank and you. I'm just so grateful for the discourse that I'm seeing taking place. I actually found your channel via this topic and have been scheduling times when I'm going to start breaking down of the other playlists that you have. Okay. Oh, something that excites me so much about this space is the unpacking mm -hmm. and how, and I'm going to say levicated, coming from a Rastafari background myself and right. also having my own gripes. Right, right. <laughs> but at the same time, having an appreciation for etymology and energy. Um, I'm so grateful for this space and the capacity that you make room for for this discourse. I can't imagine the amount of discipline that it must take in your day-to-day -day life to maintain room for this type of discourse. So hats <laughs> off to you, Muna. Give thanks. <laughs> like right, right in my right in alignment with energy I'm on. Just giving thanks, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I'm actually gonna work backwards. Um, the doctor that just spoke, I I was like, "Where's my tambourine? <laughs> Church, I keep, you what? know, <laughs> you know." When she was just breaking down, like not only the DNA physically, but also, you know, when we've been carrying anything for a long time that's been unaddressed in the realms that we can't see. Anytime we open as women our wombs or as men maybe drop seed, we have to really understand, yeah, at some point it might pop up back in a lifetime that we're not here to really give them the guidance from the things we learned. And something that the other lady said, I'm going to circle back to when she said, like, from a young age, she heard the, like, the frequency. 
And it wasn't until going into this discourse where she was able to see things from a certain place. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I, I'm building and the sound that I'm building is, it is so important, so important. And we're not going to get all the information from everybody. Like I have very good record keepers in my family. And then I also have learned painfully that even the best record keepers are only working with the information they have. True. So line upon line, precept upon precept, upon precept, precept here and just the taking a little, yeah, and <laughs> saying, making sense out of it and putting things together. And this is what I've appreciated loved <laughs> so much <laughs> about this discourse is because I have been coming into a space for myself when I was actually, when your channel found me, I'm gonna say, I was in a space where I was just like, I have a lot of data. And one thing I keep hearing this sister say is, get into your story, dig into your mm -hmm. story. We mm -hmm. know, especially through this discourse, everybody's going to give the truest truth that they feel confident sharing and it's only still going to be through their lens, their narrative. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to get every side of the story that we have access to, to make mm -hmm. sense out of nonsense. True, true, true. And break it down because it's only then that we can start to make sense of certain things. True. Why true. do I have four uncles that are younger than me? <laughs> why do I have, you know, all these questions that as you look at the culture and again, just dipping in the Jeremy sauce as we, the conversation when Jeremy was offering his offerings, why are certain quote unquote normalities plaguing certain cultures? Mm -hmm. Is it because we've just because of a coping mechanism, because we're so resilient, and because we've had to, through trauma, excise um, a certain satirical lean to cope that we've now normalized. Um, and I'm sure this is a Roku remote, it probably applies to every culture, but as it speaks to the Caribbean culture, the ability to humorize <laughs> Yeah, we can't have everything. I'm that. That <laughs> no, and that's why a few nights ago, I can't remember which one it was when you talked about like um, the the breaking the program that the island, this specific island in the Caribbean, because I remember you brought up another couple of islands and mm -hmm. their misunderstanding of Jamaicans and how they were considered gem and apple of the eye of certain colonizings mm -hmm. um, and where w w certain ones were sent to. And this is where we see a breeding ground for misunderstandings among the islands. But there's so many things that are so common. And that is of one that stood out to me as a, a descendant of Jamaicans. I'm a first generation. I'm the first one born on any farm land. Um, and in looking at how we tend to use humor to mask, and Jeremiah touched on this masking, whether it's the ganja or the liquor or the codependence and over supporting whatever the addiction is there's going to be a tendency in spaces where this is not addressed to mitigate while the intention might be oh, i just want to make things better for the next generation and find a way to appease and ease the impact we have to get to this point and this is why i'm actually glad the sister that came before the doctor and after Jeremiah, where she had said, I'm glad they did it this way. I said yes and amen when she said that. And as she unpacked, I could see that where she was going with it. But I had my own reasons for saying why I'm glad that it happened this way. Because if it wasn't so vague, it wouldn't have caused a certain population to dig deeper. True. The quest seekers, the truth seekers, the at-talibs, you know to dig a little deeper, to say, well, then what, what could cause it? This is a puzzle. Right. What, what, where, where, what am I supposed to make of this? 
Mm -hmm. um, the <laughs> sister that came before the doctor, she mentioned how from a young age, I remember hearing Bob's music from a very, very, very young age. I was digging in crates. I was a crate fetcher. I was a crate maiden because my dad used to run dance. And I used to be fetching 45s from a very young age. And one thing that always stood out to me from a very young age, I wasn't the same age she heard Bob, but I was much younger. And the one thing that stood out to me was, this is a man who's being ripped apart by dichotomy. When I listen to his music, I can hear a crying out for a way to be seen and heard and at the same time, a man who knows who he is and is clear, confident about what he knows he has learned. And that's why it always resonated with me. It wasn't until I got started getting older, I started learning and hearing one to a one few and then saying, oh my gosh, what a puzzle. Yeah. Um, I've, I've never, been offered the platform to dive deeper into the torment that this man must have been experiencing. In my own life recently, I also have witnessed ones who in their ministry, that is them a thousand percent. Nobody can put them out to ground and say, I know them that. Hmm. But then also when I hear the things that they're wrestling with and see as an observer, um, especially as someone who's intimate and, and, and has heard things that they share, I also can say, oh my goodness, I see it now because while this can be your strength and this can be your utter destruction, <laughs> um, when you, your own outlet, because you don't have history, you don't have information. And when the custodians of facts are still walking through right. their pain and it. trauma in a time that doesn't accommodate those conversations, right. the best you're going to get is their rose-colored version of it. And that's all you have to work with at any given time. And every generation is going to have to deal with that to some degree. It's just that the hope is that as we become more transparent and have these conversations more candidly and more radical candor is, in, is welcomed in these spaces, the only way we're going to reduce that for our children is by doing what we're doing right now. So when we keep that in mind and we know that at some point, we didn't know all what we know now, but we heard, we heard a man, a human, wrestling with himself indeed there's a reason why it resonates with every single person exactly it's the internal struggle <laughs> yes and yeah. so the lady said that did the, the, the in um did the entertainment industry no i feel they really did know did and they? i feel that they knew and they knew that that one piece of how much he was willing to vanguard. Listen, you could try to suppress my voice all you want, whatever the suppression mechanism is, but I'm going to mega ball out. Then, but, but and that's who's supposed to hear will hear what I'm really saying. What they told you, they told you in the beginning. Thank you so much for that Friday. Thank you so much for sharing your voice. We have a few more people behind us. Yeah, it's late in the UK. I know the UK. I'm in the UK. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm gonna lift up. I just came no, to no, say the one the UK massive, but at the beginning they told us it was the whalers, and when you listen to it, exactly. it's the only thing that the people in the ghetto had was this crying out. So right. they stay true to form to say, <clears throat> sorry, let me let me drink something real quick. Yeah, yeah, that I'm gonna use my voice, and even until mm -hmm. today, we see that really the only time the mass majority of the people are listening. The popular society is listening to even a black man, a so-called black man is when mm -hmm. he's speaking in this capacity, when well, he's transmitting what he has to say through music or through prose yeah. or through, that's the only time they're really listening. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Like, right. like entertain me by the rivers of Babylon. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's still that kind of way. They're very, very much true. So, <clears throat> with that considered, if this is the medium by which we're going to have this conversation, then 
I put it in a song. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Exactly. So and and I think he was very much aware of that. And that's what I was really yes. trying to tie down to. Very much I, aware. I I I I I I, per- I can see clearly that he perceived that this is my only exodus. Um and 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 most people who are prolific visionaries, most like most of them have are prone to deep states of depression because most of them realize, hey, you know, like it's only so much impact I'm gonna have in this iteration of my existence and it's gonna have to be leaving things behind for people to pick up. And so things that as I went back and listened to some of like even high tide or low tide, I'm gonna be your friend. Like that was painful, you know? And, and I know what it feels like to say, hey, I don't know what it is to receive this, but I'm gonna be it because somewhere down the line, I'm putting it out there for it to come back and then forward in the next generation, you know? So like I could hear the pain points and if it weren't for the gaps in these movie and going back and unpacking and deep diving, as much as I saw the humanity in him then, I would not have been able to really dig a little deeper now. I'm not sanctifying, I'm not idolizing. I'm, I'm seeing that what I've seen in my own life and it's actually really happening in real time is there's certain spaces I've been meant to remain in for a little while longer that once upon a time, if my head did hot, I would lift up, but I'm like, okay, because it's given me a moment of pause. Not say me not lift up, but it's given me a moment of pause to take a different perspective, even if I shift two degrees and see things from a different angle that when I go and do what I'm supposed to do, I have a different perspective. So, all right, what's the best? (laughs) Exactly. So I just want to say this. Yeah, because I know the UK people don't want to go to bed and give thanks for everybody (laughs) who's holding on all now. But I just want to say you have inspired so much because I had actually suspended quite a bit because I was literally paralyzed um, as I was living through certain things in my own life and not sure how to move. I know I know myself, I know how I move, I know the people I move with that are my board of counsel, but at the same time, I was like, this is a situation unique because it, the behavior that I'm seeing is actually reflecting a cry. Not to say I'm gonna go make people take liberty, I mean, whatever, but I'm just saying, before I leave a space, let me look at what the person's tools were that they were limited to at the time, take and make the best of it so I can make informed movements going forward um, and say, okay, what I'm offering going forward now is more informed. Because if this was, I'm 43 now going and looking at 44. If this was where this man was after his whole life's existence, which was not only his, but it was his mom's and his dad's, this now reminds me of the importance of the unpacking conversation. Yep. Because we can feel, and you know, we all know at this point, healing is not linear. It's, um, not, it's, it, it's never going to be. It. It's never going to be. So this is why yeah. we need spaces where we can unpack safely. Thank so you shout so out to you, give thanks, just honoring you, sis. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank Everybody you. who yeah. shared their perspectives whether it be on the live or in the comments the comments are so edifying for me i learned so much even when there's you know like yeah he <laughs> me, i learn a lot so but you know just you are you're on the right path i just want to multiply your strength and keep doing what nice. you're doing because you're reaching people who you would not meet in real life and sure. you're passing the baton on for us to do what we're supposed to do over here in our little jurisdiction. So setting a strength and yeah, setting a strength and and hats off to you. (laughs) Yeah, blessed love. Yeah, I'm gonna you lift up. Give thanks for the time. Come through anytime. All right. All right. Now we have Tierra. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Friday, for sharing your thoughts. And again, this is what this space is for. There's some people who may say, I'm on already, on already, done already, stop talking about Bob Marley. But not realizing this is a conversation that transitions into what we're doing right now, which is unpacking the culture, unpacking our own personal experiences. So with that said, Tierra, I, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, feel free to share. Yes, ma'am. Can I be heard? You can be heard. 
Okay, thank you for uh, allowing me up tonight. I enjoyed your reading, especially the cross-referencing that you do on particular subjects. I love the way that it's organized in that way. Um, thank I you. just happened to be watching the uh, One Love uh, when it hit streaming the other day. Okay. And it's the dichotomy of, you know, him being this anti-musician and, I mean, not anti-musician, anti-rock star type of, humble person but he fell to the same <laughs> entertainment tropes mm -hmm. i guess that the behind the music thing where your circle your original mm -hmm. circle gets smaller and smaller and then you just left to the wolves mm -hmm. kind of sort of it seemed that way to me and um i just yeah i just found that interesting and it seemed as though a lot of that was Bob's doing, doing. He talked a lot about his trauma and uh, what he went through, I guess, as a child and kind of like the coldness that he displayed toward Rita. Mm -hmm. it, it really showed up in a lot of other relationships, you know, just you reading the Dan Taylor um, mm -hmm. ordeal or whatever. It, it's like, those are two very different... <laughs> different uh descriptions of the same incident and if it was as simple as dan taylor said it was there's no no way the response should have been that but um i mean this is the same guy who wasn't talking to either of you know like anyone who he came up with it seemed like originally by the end of his career yeah, or during the height of his popularity yeah, I mean, you know, we can start off by on the wrong, on the right track, and and something pushes us onto the wrong track. It easily uh, can happen, and it looks like even in Rita's book, she says that like by this time, he he drifted off to sea, right? He drifted off mm -hmm. into into this into the arms of people who wanted to then exploit him. Because the higher you climb, they said the higher the monkey climb the more he's exposed, right? So mm -hmm. the more it is that people now see it advantageous not to be with you because of you as a person, but to be with you or around you because of what they can get, then that changes the tone. You know what I mean? You don't know who to trust. You know, you don't know exactly. who is who and who is authentic. But at the same time, those who really care for you, you may see them as trying to hold you back. You know, oh, you don't want me to progress. You're just hating on yeah. me. You understand what I'm saying? So I think exactly. that like many people fame, like they say, it's a drug. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's a drug. Mm -hmm. And it um it has drugged many people in the past with, with the humblest intentions. And they found themselves in very compromising situations. So uh yeah, I, I agree yeah, that it's yeah. I'm going to go ahead and let the other callers speak. But yeah, it's just amazing to me how like the characters come and go in his life and, you know, so much toward there by the end. I think I heard you say that Rita wasn't around all the time or they, like, she didn't know what was going on. And yeah. I think I heard you say something about he said he wasn't coming back to his mother's house. No, like, well, that's kind of odd. No, no, it, that was the last time he got. She said basically, oh, okay, that, that was the last time he would have gone there because he got sick after that, and then he had to go. Well, he didn't have to go. They elected to send him to Germany, so that was the last time oh, he got beat at his okay. mother. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I misunderstood that. I said, well, did he have a, you know, a bust up with his mom too at the end? No, no, no. But, that he was uh, sick. He got uh, sick, and then and then that was it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I was just trying to put the dots together when I saw the title of your live. And because uh, I'm trying to figure out who was that final crew, you know, that was, you know, there with them. Because I know right. Esther Anderson, not Esther Anderson, what's her, what's her name? Gwen Anderson? No, by that time, um, the, that's the been gone. Um, yeah. It didn't seem like just everyone who I know to be quote unquote main players around the Marley uh, story or whatever you know, was gone by that time. And, yeah. you know, which is kind of sad. It's sad. It's a lot to learn from the conversation. Like I said, we see it time and time again. The music industry is a study in and of itself. <laughs> you know, yes, And you will see, you will see patterns repeat continuously. Um, and it's sad that even up until this very day, it's still happening. 
We still see it today. We have like a huge music industry, although I'm not diving over into that. I mean, it's everywhere. We have a huge fallout right now in the music industry. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Yeah. Right mm-hmm. now, right. <laughs> as we speak, <laughs> you understand? And yeah. a lot of stuff and has but- come out and more is coming out. So you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and let you guys continue your conversation. I'll catch you on your next live. Thank you so much, Terry. You have a blessed night. All right. Good night. All right. I'm so welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, before AMSA goes, if anybody have anything else to share, feel free to click the button now. We're going to wind down. Oh, my goodness. Two hours pounded live. Well spent time. AMSA, share your thoughts. Okay. Thank you so much for You're opening. You're welcome. Sister Amuna, I just want to start by giving thanks and praise to you. Um, I actually did a little bit of a deep dive into your your um, your stats, and I realized I was like, "Wow, you're at nine k views. You're at twelve k views," and I was like, "Everything happens in divine time, and it's no accident that this movie was released this year in February, and you experience like." almost like a virality as a result of this this divine intervention and i do want to acknowledge you and the role that you're playing in this divine plan for furthering the message the prophecies that bob marley has been sharing with us and through your medium on youtube we're able to like also further that message to a wider audience a younger audience and through the medium of literacy, give thanks and praise because you have a very, very important role in this work. I see it, and I'm so grateful for you for this contribution that you're making. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I And, and I just want to say to people that I've been holding space <laughs> uh, for a healing conversation for a long time because I think that's in order for us to move forward as a people, we have to address the things that has happened to us intergenerationally. So when people think that this conversation is about gossip or about sensationalism, it's not, right? Ultimately, we get to this point. Shout out to LF subscriber from long, long time. You know, um, So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts and hopefully the true intentions of the conversation and, and that healing energy can go forward into our own lives and that we can touch those in and around us as well. Yes. In a positive way. Yeah. You know, and I just wanted to acknowledge you because there, you know, the, God is mathematical. God is math. That is my eye. That's balance. That's, that's the message. And when we're able to recognize the patterns in the universe, we're able to communicate with God. So I wanted to hold space and recognize that pattern that I've identified between you communicating this information, the release of the movie and us like sharing in this discourse right now. I'd further like to just comment on, of course, what we've been all discussing for the past several weeks, even the past two months, it seems regarding Bob Marley's uh, journey through life. And so many things have come up for me, especially, but one in particular is that God sends its messengers into the world to help uplift the spirits of men to raise the consciousness. And Bob is one of many that has have been sent, many before him, many after, many currently walking the earth with us now. I will say that I've definitely had the privilege of being in spaces, sharing spaces with men of that caliber. And there's always the same hubris, the same fall or the same issue around ego. And there's this proverb in Chinese uh, literature called the I Ching. It's called the possession in great measure. And it talks about those who are wealthy or those who accumulate great fame, their biggest biggest challenge is responsibility. Responsibility for those they're impacting and for their own conduct. As it relates to a man in particular like Bob, one thing he he just kept falling short of was exercising sexual discipline, like many of you said on the in the chat, and also that level of humility, cultivating that humility. It, it seems as if Bob was, as he was teaching us his many lessons, he was learning them as he was teaching them. And 
it's it's incredible because sometimes you are born with a certain ashe, with a certain energy, and you notice it because it's being confirmed, verified, and reinforced through your interaction with the world. And it, it's challenging because it definitely goes to the head. So, you know, I, I just wanted to emphasize that, highlight that. It is such a beautiful experience. I'm grateful for Bob's example, the, the negative and the positive. He certainly left us with beautiful, beautiful lessons. He's one of many teachers, prophets, um, sages, like abbots, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just grateful for this space. Thank you so much, Amuna. I appreciate your presence here. I'm from Brooklyn, by the way. Jamaica. Brooklyn is in the house heavy. <laughs> Clarendon, James Hill. Brooklyn, Brooklyn is in Brooklyn. the house heavy. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Day, yeah. And you Brooklyn know, Day, yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of Brooklyn in the chat too. Yeah. Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> Chi State area. Okay. Everybody, everywhere, them there, man. You know, thank yeah. you for coming on, Ansa. Thank you for letting your voice be heard as well. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. We've been rocking for two hours and 10 minutes. And y'all know the, the, the funny thing about me? I don't like talking long. <laughs> if you could believe it. I, I don't only talk when I have something to say, you know what I mean? Otherwise that I'm quiet and taking in the sights. So um, thank you so much for that. I'm going to go ahead and wind down now. Thank you. And, um, Blessings. Have a good night. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Have a good night as well. So for those who just came in, you don't know already, go to the top um, and listen to it from the beginning. And we're going to see you in the comment section below. I want to shout out to everyone who has supported the book Island Twist. It's another part of the healing process, the writing, the expressing, the touching on topics that may be taboo in our community. And we can do that through literature and story. And that's why story has the power to transform lives. Whether you tell it in poems, whether you tell it in short form, whether you tell it in music, stories have the power to transform lives, right? And so Island Twist is really a down to earth story about, you know, Caribbean culture and things that um, we kind of didn't have space or opportunity to move through uh, and just giving us an opportunity to identify and and, and it have some funny twists and turns. Can you know something like Luaf already? So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And if you just want to read along, I'm already reading it. So you can go to the playlist and read along as well. I think I got everything that, let me see. Yeah, to whom much is given, much is required. And like I, I appreciate what was just said, that as Bob was sharing lessons, he was learning them as well, right? Because it's one thing to, to say, hey, I want to sing. I want to do music. I want to do whatever it is. It's another thing to understand the magnitude of what you are signing up for right? The weight of your words. This is why, you know, what you say, sometimes you may see me stop and think because you have to chew your words before you spit them out. You know what I mean? What you're saying, what you're thinking, you have to process it so that you, cause you can't draw them back. Most you could say is, yo, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say X, Y, and Z. Right. But sometimes we speak and we create our reality because we didn't take the time to measure our speech. You understand what I'm saying? So that's also important of why, like I'm as you know, why we are in the situation that we are as a people, as a community. Even sometimes, even the things we say, and I'll just leave it at that in passing, like, oh man, go cost that person there. You're literally saying you're gonna curse them. <laughs> right? Whether even in the words that we choose to use, we're cursing and using these curses to to, to create your reality. So you're speaking it into existence. You understand what I'm saying? So these are the things that even as a culture and as a people, we have to continually be mindful of like, what did you just say? Or what did I just say? Or why did I just say that? You understand? So when I see that he he is struggling with on one side, and, and, and Sadella really gave us the keys to this conversation. This is why I say write it down. Sadella was struggling. She wanted to do what was right. And his father was pulling her to what? To the flesh. So that struggle between I want to go closer to God and being pulled to the flesh, that was the actual way, according to his mother, that he was conceived. That was the song. That was the soundtrack. That was the rhythm that was playing when in during his conception. 
So this is why you, in my estimation, you see this internal struggle because his mother laid it out, whether she intended to or not, she gave us the keys and told us like, this was what it was. She felt sorry. There goes the poor Bob. The father made her feel like uh, she was responsible and she came through and then, and then he's finessed her and then boop your braid. You know what I mean? So with that said, I, I thank them. I want to thank them officially if I haven't already. I want to thank the family for their transparency. I think beyond the music, their story, their story has the power to touch lives as it is doing right now. And without their transparency, without their willingness to, to, to be an example, to come before the people and, and show themselves in such a, a, a light that, you know, many of us may not even have the courage to do the good, the bad, and indifference and allow themselves to be seen and judged and examined in such a way that many people may shy away and be like, yo, why are you doing that? But the truth is healing requires that. You understand? The, the process requires examination. It, it, it requires all of these things in order for us to come through the other side. Flatbush is in the building. <laughs> Brooklyn is in the building heavy. <laughs> yeah. So don't let me go on my healing, my healing conversation, because that is a space where I, I really understand that it's a must. This is going to make us to be able to move forward um, from this point. And we're not just talking about from our familiar issues. I'm talking about as a community, as a nation, as a people, as humanity. Ja Jersey is in the building. Jacqueline is from Jersey. So if you guys want to do roll call so you can see who's calling, I know a lot of UK is in the building. If you do roll call, I'm just going to come through real quick and shout out all the roll call and then I'm going to roll, 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 roll on out here and get some rest. <laughs> it's like a river set, then go and sleep and wake up and we're still there. Yeah, this is a long, <laughs> this is a long live. New York is in the house, just tripping. Philly is in the house, life with Gina Rasta in the city, Brooklyn all day. We have Georgia in the house from Gloria. Let me see what's I gone. Texas T in the house, Texas, Angela BK, Scorpio Rising, Harlem, Harlem World is in the building. Let me see what I go on this or no. That was the beginning of, I already know that UK is in the building. Let me see what else, who else is in the building before we go. Right now it's, it's different time if you're on East Coast, West Coast, let me see. Canada, Devon is in Canada close enough. How is the weather up there, Devon? Canada is in the building. Minnesota, Mary is coming from Minnesota, Little Caribbean, all day, all day. Mind Spot is from Florida, Rosedale, Queens is in the building, KP. Long Beach, California, she carried beyond. California is in the building. Crown Heights is in the building. Dr. Charles, California is in the building. Let me go in, I'm a selector bag. Hold on, hold on, hold on, selector. We on, come again, selector. Yo, Brooklyn is, what? Brooklyn just get the whole of the notification then? Flatbush, Brooklyn, in the building again. And Leah Marilyn is in the building. <laughs> Queens is getting an extra shout out. Alabama, Jasmine, welcome to the conversation. VA is in the building. Another Brooklyn in the is Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> I went I went to DC is in the building. North Carolina, Brooklyn night has been transported. Biblical stories with Anne Joseph. Scotland, all right. We at Trish, you up them time here at night. <laughs> Amsa says all the, all the Jamaicans live in Brooklyn. <laughs> Either Brooklyn or the Bronx. <laughs> no, some Jamaicans live in Queens too. Some live in Queens. Some live in Queens. Yeah, Brooklyn is heavy in the spot. We got to bring up Brooklyn, Little Caribbean, Bushwick Ave, all these places. All right, guys, this has been great. I want to say everybody have a blessed night. You know, continue to write, continue to share, continue to inquire, continue to ask questions, humble yourself so that you can get the answers to the questions that you ask. And with that said, everybody have a blessed night and we will talk again soon. All right, one.